All right. Today is Wednesday, October 20th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but it's going to be shorter than usual. I hope so, of course. We're going to stick to the market's information because we have a lot of earnings to cover. However, rest assured, I'm going to have a headlines of the day video for you. In it, we're going to discuss the inflation situation and the numbers that we got from Germany. Stunning numbers regarding inflation over in Germany. We're going to talk about the out of touch comments from billionaire Nelson Piltz, who, by the way, slipped and said something that he is not supposed to say. We're also going to cover the ever grand crisis and the collapse of the real estate industry over in China. We're also going to go over market sentiment information what the big guys are doing in terms of positioning, what retail investors are doing. All of this will be in the headlines of the day video. But for now, we're sticking to the market's information and let's start with how the market performed today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closed in the green by 152.3 points or a gain of 0.43%. The Nasdaq closed in the red down by 7.41 points or a decline of 0.05%. The S&P 500 closing in the green by 16.56 points or a gain of 0.37%. What about the sector's performance today leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal REITs? The number two for the silver, utilities. Number three for the bronze, healthcare. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by technology, communication services, and consumer cyclicals. The action today was defensive in nature. The action in the market was led by the defensive sectors of the market, REITs, utilities, healthcare, even though yields for the 10-year treasury continue to rise higher and higher and higher, which goes against REITs and utilities. Yet market participants today decided to go with REITs and utilities, even though yields are popping higher. What does that say? It says the market participants are getting a little bearish here, and they're positioning themselves in the defensive sectors of the market. I disagree with this sentiment right now because yields are popping higher. And if you are looking for safety, you should be parking in the healthcare sector of the market, the neutral sector, not REITs and utilities, because if yields continue to pop higher, they're going to suffer. Moving on to the advanced to decline ratios. What about the NYSE 68% advancing versus 29% declining? The NASDAQ 56% advancing versus 41% declining. Moving on to futures, the dollar is pretty much flat for the day, slight weakness, and this was good enough for commodities to rise higher for the most part. The ratty in crude oil prices continue to go on and on and on. We have gains of about 1% apiece for the WTI and Brent. Likewise, we have gains for natural gas, heating oil, and gasoline prices. They continue to go higher and higher and higher. We have a massive problem here. Energy prices are pushing inflation out of whack. The Fed lost control. Central banks across the world lost control. And the best example is what's going on right now in Germany. What about softs? We have losses led by lumber, cocoa, and OJ futures. I remain long OJ here for a rebound play. I believe that the rebound will go on even though OJ futures took a break today. On the other hand, we have gains led by cotton, sugar and coffee futures watch out for the rally in cotton futures it continues to go on and on and on and these prices will be reflected in apparel prices so prepare to pay more for clothing soon enough with this inflation we're not going to be able to afford housing we're not going to be able to afford food and we're not going to be able to afford clothing this is the dire future of this country this is the reckless madness engineering of the economy by the fed and the ruling class what about metals we have a rally across the board with exception of palladium palladium was down about one and a half percent today meanwhile we have gains for gold silver platinum and copper all rising higher as the u.s dollar softens at least for now what about meats flat action for live cattle futures meanwhile modest gains for feeder cattle futures on the other hand lean hogs futures experiencing losses of about one and a half percent the most bullish sector for now in commodities is grains food prices are surging significantly higher you combine the reckless monetary policy with the climate crisis on top of that, we have labor strikes pushing farming equipment prices higher and higher and higher. Fuel and transportation costs 
are rising higher and higher and higher, and therefore prepare to pay more for food. And grains futures will continue to surge higher and higher and higher. I continue to be bullish on soybean products. They're going to rise higher in the next few days, along with corn, by the way. We have massive gains here, led by soybean oil futures. I remain long soybean oil. We also have gains for soybeans, soybean meal, corn, wheat, rough rice, oats, canola, all surging higher. So much for transitory. And watch out, by the way, for this piece of news out of Brazil. We have a damning report by the Brazilian Senate Committee, which recommended that Brazilian President Bolsonaro should be indicted for crimes against humanity due to the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. If we have a political crisis in Brazil, commodities prices will surge even higher. So we continue to watch the political mayhem over at Brazil. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Leading the tables today, Apple with about 1.1 million contracts, trading hands today, about 72% of those were calls. At a number two, Tesla, the souffle with about 666,000 contracts, interesting number of course. About 50% of those were calls. Tesla reported earnings after the bell. The earnings report is excellent, but again, it's an overvalued stock, out of whack, obscene valuations and therefore the stock is not reacting positively it is pretty much on the flat line last time i checked and here it is at number three the ticker w-i-s-h this is context logic a meme stock and we have over half a million contracts exchanging hands today for the name about 82 and a half percent of those were calls and watch out for the surge in volume for call options in pinterest we got the news that paypal is thinking about acquiring Pinterest, and therefore they're buying calls on this name. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with, you guessed it, the ticker PINS Pinterest. Plenty of trades, we're going to cover one of them. They bought the 70 bucks calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday. They have two days till expiration. They are expecting the name to pop an additional 12% or more by Friday in two days. They paid about 30 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $800,000. The likelihood is we're going to see massive short covering here, so this trade makes a lot of sense. What about the trade for the ticker P E double N? This is Penn National Casinos. They're buying calls here, the 83 calls for the expiration date, October 22nd meaning this upcoming Friday, two days till expiration. Yet they are expecting the name to pop higher by more than 6% by then. They paid about 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about half a million dollars. And what about the ticker BIDU, Baidu? They continue to buy calls in this name in an aggressive manner. They bought the 205 calls in this case with the expiration date November 19th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 12% or so by then and they paid about two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker shpw this is a company called shapeway holdings the name popped higher today by more than 50 percent this is extremely interesting and the reason is it came hand in hand with the pop in pinterest i'm not aware of any relationship here but the moment we got the news that paypal is thinking about acquiring pinterest this name popped higher and they are betting for more gains to come by buying the 12 and a half calls for the expiration date november 19th with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 15 and a half percent by then they paid about one buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 2.4 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker qqq the triple q's the nasdaq they're buying puts here the 329 puts for the expiration date december 17th with the expectations that the Nasdaq could drop by more than 12% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 10 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3 million. What about the trade for the ticker IMAX? IMAX? They're buying calls here, the name popped higher. As you can see in the charts, we have a bull flag pattern. It is playing out and they're betting for more gains to come by buying the 22 calls for the expiration date. November 19th, with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 5% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. 
But what about the trade for the ticker ARKK for Tesla Witch, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest ETF? They're betting against this name by buying the 109 puts for the expiration date November 19th, with the expectations that the name will drop down by more than 8% or so by then. They paid about one buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker fdx fedex they're buying calls here the 247 and a half calls for the expiration date october 29th with the expectations that fedex could pop higher by more than seven percent by then and they paid about 65 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about seven hundred thousand dollars and lastly what about the trade for the ticker qs quantum scape they're buying calls here the 31 calls for the expiration date november 19th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 24% by then, they paid about 70 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $700,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? As you can see, the majority of the action is in the inflationary side of the market, financials, energy, industrials, and materials. On top of that, we have more activities, bullish activities, in the defensive side of the market, healthcare, REITs, utilities, and the consumer brands in the consumer defensive sector of the market. We're talking about Procter & Gamble. We're talking about brands like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Unilever, Kimberly Clark, all at performing. And the reason is we got more earnings now. Yesterday from Procter & Gamble, today from Nestle, and they're all indicating that they're jacking prices higher. They're exercising their pricing power. They're passing the extra cost all the way down to the end customer. And therefore, these are companies you want to stick with in this inflationary environment. The underperformance comes from the growth momentum and tech side of the market the big caps the trading down now microsoft google amazon and yesterday we talked about apple and facebook holding the nasdaq well they're weakening today they're closing the green yet they're weakening and we're seeing more weakness in the software and chips side of the market too we have certain interesting moves here paypal for example down about five percent today off the news that they are thinking about acquiring pinterest on the other hand of course pinterest rose about 13 to 14 percent today at performing the rest of the market we also have facebook let's talk about it since it's already here we have bad news washington dc attorney general General filed a motion to add Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg as a defendant in a lawsuit accusing Facebook of misleading its users about the security of their personal data. We have bad news for Zuckiniberg here because yesterday Facebook agreed on Tuesday to pay up to $14.25 million to settle claims brought by the federal government that the company had discriminated against American workers. On top of that, Zucchiniberg is now thinking about changing the name of Facebook altogether. There's a lot of heat against Facebook. He is under the microscope and his approach is distract altogether by changing the name. Zucchiniberg has no problem in suppressing your freedom of speech by his goons or fact checkers. Any speech that goes contrary to the narrative and Zucchiniberg will crush you and shut your mouth and suppress your freedom of speech. But he is throwing stones from a glass house. He is discriminating against American workers. He is spying on you and he is selling your personal data. And these are the guys who are leading the so-called woke movement today, lecturing us about what's right and what's wrong. Start by looking at the mirror, Zucchiniberg. We have more revelations now about the so-called whistleblower. Well, we knew all along that she's not a whistleblower. She's an agent and we know who she's working for. eBay billionaire Omidyar is backing the Facebook whistleblower. In other words... We have a billionaire backing the whistleblower financially to hurt another billionaire. We have two asshole billionaires fighting against each other, using this whistleblower as a distraction. It's all a show. It's all a theater. Nothing is real. Nothing you see in TV is real. It's all planned and manufactured to engineer your perspective. Anyhow, the rant is over. Let's move on here and talk about another company that underperformed today. The ticker NVX down about 15% today. And the reason is... Novavax plunges as manufacturing problems reportedly imperil the firm's COVID-19 vaccine. There was a lot of hope. They were already late, by the way. The majority of people already got jabbed. And on top of that, now they got problems with the manufacturing. Forget about it. This is garbage and the stock will go down, even though we have plenty of activities in the options market. They're buying calls. They're buying puts. They're going bananas here. But this is not looking good so far for Novavax. 
But aside from Novavax, when you look at the map, where do you want to hide here? Certainly not technology, when interest rates are rising higher. Certainly not REITs or utilities for the same reason. We have banks, we have oil, we have materials, we have industrials, the inflationary trade, but these are also becoming crowded now. So you have two defensives in healthcare and consumer defensives to hide in. I still see the healthcare sector of the market as attractive for now, a place to park in either in the pharmaceutical names or pharmacy names, insurance names, medical devices. We got results from Abbott Laboratories and the name is popping higher. There are good names here in the healthcare sector of the market to hide in until the earnings storm is over. Moving on to charts, starting with the 30 minutes chart of the SPY, the S&P 500. What's going on here? The melt up continues, grinding higher and higher and higher, gapping higher in the morning via algorithmic buying. The volume is still down, indicating that the the computers, the robots, are still buying. At this point, either you're already in the move and you're riding the wave higher, or you're too late, you cannot jump on this one because it is coming closer to an end. The only choice you have as a trader right now is to wait for a reversal signal. And then you have a trade to the downside. For now, we have no reversal signal at all. Nothing at all. If anything, the chart remains bullish for now. But it is trading in a zone, if you look at the RSI, in a sell zone. This is not a sell signal. It is a sell zone. You perhaps want to book some profits if you already rode the wave higher. But you should not bet against the SPY until and unless you have a reversal signal. Because as we went over a second ago over the heat map, we have financials, energy, materials, industrials, the inflationary side of the market, along with the defensive side of the market, healthcare, REITs, utilities, and defensives. All of these components of the SPY are still working and they're trading higher. And therefore the rally in the SPY is more resilient than the one in the queues, for example. But here is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY. The rebound, the move higher is vertical now. Now, it is ridiculous, it is obscene, it is excessive, but we don't have a reversal signal yet. Everybody's eyeing all time highs at around 4,549 and a half. In all likelihood, the algos are looking at the same number and they want to reach that destination first. The problem is, and this is typical behavior of charts, by the way, as you get closer to the destination that the algos are eyeing, the human being intervenes, the traders, and they say, you know what, I'm not going to wait till all time highs till the target, the destination, before booking my profits, because everybody's waiting for the same destination, for the same number, before they start pulling the trigger and booking profits. What happens, usually, is traders start to pull the plug, booking profits before the number is reached. And therefore, don't be surprised here if the chart of the continuous contract on the SPY pulls back before reaching all time highs. For now, the volume remains low, it is receding, the momentum indicators remain extremely strong we don't have any reversal signal here yet keyword yet moving on to the queues 30 minutes chart this is a little different than the spy it's still trading higher but it closed in the red and we have a negative development here in a bear flag pattern we don't have a reversal signal yet we have a bearish sign but we don't have a reversal signal yet I like to be ahead of the game in staging my positions and therefore I bought puts in the queues a couple of days ago and I added to that same position today, and I will continue to add to it as the chart develops. But you gotta bear in mind here that if you're gonna buy these options, you have to give yourself the time. If you're buying weekly expiration options, cheap ones, out of the money, you're out of your mind because you're gambling. In the long run, you're gonna lose money. You're better off buying one contract with enough time than 10 contracts expiring this Friday. And the reason is, if you're wrong, you have the room to maneuver and cut your losses in the one contract with a longer expiration date. But if you have 10 with the expiration date of this upcoming Friday, if the trade goes against your way, you're going to lose all your money. It's gone. It's over. So be responsible in your options trading. We're eyeing the support of 372. You cannot have a chart like this trading higher when the chart of the 10-year yield continue to rise higher and higher and higher. Moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract, for the Nasdaq. Again, a different picture than the continuous contract of the SPY. Here, we're seeing the momentum indicator, at least in the RSI, stalling for a little bit. We don't have a confirmation that it is reversing, but it is stalling. Likewise, the chart is facing resistance for now at the neckline of the head and shoulder. Another sign, a bearish sign. Look at the volume. It is reversing higher again on selling, not buying. 
and therefore we're getting closer and closer to the end of this rebound higher. Moving on to the 30 minutes chart of the IWM, the Russell 2000. We had negative pattern here from a candlestick perspective, a bear flag, a reverse ABC, we discussed that one yesterday. But I also told you, I don't agree with the narrative that the IWM is a leading indicator. And if it goes down, then it's just a matter of days before the Qs and the SPY follow through and go down as well. I told you that I believe in the rotational aspect of the market. When the Qs outperform, the IWM, the Russell 2000 underperforms. Now that the Qs appear to be topping for now, all of a sudden the IWM, the Russell 2000 is popping higher and it is forming a bull flag formation, eyeing the resistance of 229. This is yet another proof that we have a rotational market while the algos and market participants bought the dip in technology of oversold conditions, they cannot ignore the rise in the 10-year yield. And now they're rotating, booking gains from the NASDAQ, the big cap technology names, and they're rotating to the Russell 2000, the reopening names, the cyclical names in the market. Moving on to the Dixie, the dollar index. Remains resilient, but this time around it closed below the support. And this is a good sign for commodities, metals, grains, softs, oil. It is good for inflation, but it is bad for the Fed and their allies. It is also bad for technology. If the dollar goes down and commodities rise higher, inflation expectations also surge higher, leading the 10-year yield to follow through and move higher too. Therefore, I continue to favor the inflationary side of the market, not the tech growth and momentum side until we have a legitimate top in the 10-year yield. Moving on to gold, what's going on here? popping higher following the move from the US dollar. But how sustainable can that be? I know some of you pointed out that we have a reverse head and shoulder formation for gold. That could be. But again, you have to confirm that move with more declines in the US dollar. You also have to confirm it with a top in the 10 year yield. And you have to confirm it with another one a top in Bitcoin. Remember, gold has three enemies. We know that the dollar is weakening. Perhaps Bitcoin will be next. But what about yields? They continue to be extremely strong. Speaking of, here is the chart of the 10-year yield. We have a trading channel, a bullish channel with higher highs and higher lows. It is just a matter of time before yields hit 1.7%. And this indeed will elicit a reaction in the stock market. The reaction will be negative for the technology side, but it will be positive for financials. And by the way, today we got the auction for the 20-year bond, and it was awful, sending yields higher. And what does that mean in a nutshell, by the way? It means the bond investors are expecting yields to move higher, and therefore the bidding for the 20-year auction today was shy. Another sign telling that yields will pop higher. And I know what the algos and market makers are eyeing. They want 2% yield on the 10-year treasury by the end of the year. And I believe they will get their wish. What does that mean for the TLT? Bond price is not so good. This is a weekly chart, of course. We're getting more confirmations here by another bearish candle, more negative divergence on the RSI and MACD indicators, telling us that the TLT will go down to at least 134 and a half, and this will come hand in hand with yields popping higher, perhaps all the way to 1.7, if not beyond that. And here is a chart for the VIX, four hours chart, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the pop in the VIX, watching the MACD indicator. It is building. Right now, it is in the process of building the pop higher. It is just a matter of time before it pops higher, and this will not be good for the SPY. So back to our discussion that we don't have a reversal signal on the SPY. You can watch the candlestick patterns on the SPY's chart, but you can also watch the VIX chart from a four hours perspective. The moment it starts to move higher and you see green candles, strong green candles, the MACD indicator, you'll know right away that we have a reversal signal for the SPY. Oh, we're getting closer and closer and closer. Here's a daily chart for Apple. What's going on here? Popping higher, reaching the resistance of 150. So so far, so good for Apple, but can it hold all the way till earnings? We know that shorts are covering. We have dip buyers buying calls in anticipation of earnings. The assumption is the stimmies are still here. The demand is so strong from consumers 
You give them free cash printed out of thin air, they're going to use that cash, that yayo, to buy gadgets from Apple. The problem is, what about the Chinese consumer? We have severe weakness in the Chinese economy, and I think this will be the bomb and the surprise in Apple's earnings. So for now, the rally appears to be stalling at around 150. I told you I continue to watch Apple and Facebook because these two names are holding the Nasdaq for now. Apple is stalling already at the resistance of 150. What about Facebook? What's going on here? This is a day daily chart I'm playing the rebound by the way I still hold calls but again as you can see the move is stopping for now we're gonna see more buying heading into earnings I believe that the earnings from Facebook will surprise to the upside this company remains a monster this is the new tobacco and I believe they will continue to deliver on the top and bottom line when earnings are released I also believe that we're gonna have a massive surprise in the earnings call this could be the name change it could also be splitting the company into half Facebook and Instagram. It also could be the resignation of Mark Zuckerberg as CEO. We're going to have a massive move after earnings, but for now, we're eyeing Facebook for weakness, at least for now. Is the pop over? And if it is, then we have a reversal signal for the NASDAQ. This is a 30 minutes chart for Facebook, and as you can see, we are starting to form bearish signals. This is a bear flag pattern. We have plenty of gaps. I'm not saying the pop is over, but it deserves a pullback to close some of these gaps. Moving on to Tesla. 30 minutes chart what's going on here again the bearishness is evident we have the earnings report the earnings are impressive but yet again not impressive enough to justify the evaluations we're waiting for the earnings call absent of any surprise the assumption is the chart will trade flat all the way to the end of the week slightly to the downside and the goal here for market makers is to make sure that the majority of call and put options that were bought before earnings expire worthless and then next week you will see the real move and it could be to the downside at least to close some of these gaps the chart could go down all the way to 800 the round number that everybody's eyeing will take it from there but the bottom line is as i expected after earnings tesla's flat and therefore you take advantage from the elevated premiums of options ahead of earnings by opening calendar calls or calendar puts moving on to tulips btc what's going on here we have all time highs surging higher the sentiment is extremely strong and extremely bullish nobody's looking at this chart right now can bring out a legitimate bearish argument everybody's on board the bitcoin will reach 100,000, and this is usually an indicator a contrarian indicator that you should jump ship book profits because we're gonna have a surprising reversal to come i know i've been saying this a few thousand points ago i get it the momentum is strong this is the formal rally, but it is a process of exchanging hands between the winners who bought the dip when everybody was bearish at 40, 42,000. They're passing the bag to the FOMOs who are buying right now, Johnny come lately, hoping that Bitcoin will pop higher in a few weeks or months to 100,000. And before you start attacking me, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And today I bought put options on Coinbase. You see, when we have people like Snowden, for example, tweeting the rocket meme with Bitcoin, this is extreme bullish sentiment and a contrarian indicator, at least in my book. Therefore, I bought put options on Coinbase. And the reason is we have a leading indicator here. The volume went down. So we already reached peak volume. The RSI in La La Land, and therefore I am expecting a pullback here as the volume of the mania recedes lastly moving on to amc what's going on here not looking good the bullish trade already achieved the objective the objective was closing the gap at around 44 we've already achieved that and now what the chart pulls back and we continue to face the resistance of 42 and a half one way to look at the chart is this is a formation of a bear flag Another way, what if this a uh, head and shoulder formation and the chart will flush down? The conclusion is, where is the juice? Where is the energy from options market traders and the so-called apes to push this name higher? Hoodling, hodling alone is not going to do the job. You need more buyers and the buyers are distracted by other names. The Chinese stocks, Pinterest, the ticker Wish and many other names. There are many other opportunities better than AMC from a trading perspective, and therefore, they're chasing those names and those trades 
and the leaving AMC. And therefore, we're seeing these pops higher, but no follow up at all. And again, I'm pragmatic. I'm not a perma bear here on AMC. I know it's going to crash at some point, but I was playing the move higher. I bought calls all the way to closing the gap, and now I'm out. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a confirmation that this is a reversal, and then I will buy puts. Moving on to earnings, we start with the reviews first. We covered three earnings yesterday. Those were Abbott, Lamb Research, and Tesla. So let's see how good or bad these earnings are. Starting with Abbott Laboratories. Yesterday, I told you that I was eyeing the diagnostic segment of the business because last quarter, the growth was 63% year over year, all in all. And it was a mind-boggling 84% growth rate year over year in international markets for the diagnostic segment. And I told you that these numbers are unrealistic. They're not going to be able to follow through with these kind of numbers in the next quarter. And this is exactly what we got. The growth for the diagnostic segment of Abbott Laboratories went down year over year from about 63% to now 48%. Is it bad? Of course not. It's still extreme growth for one segment of the business. But other segments are also growing, be it at a slower pace than last quarter. So why was the stock trading higher today? It was already beaten down ahead of earnings, and therefore the minimum expectations were met. They're not losing growth. They're not in negative territory. The numbers are still impressive, but of course, realistically, they're not gonna live to the unrealistic numbers of last quarter. So this was good enough. You saw short covering in Abbott and the stock will be stable for now. Of course, the company has to keep these numbers and this rate of growth because once the growth rate slides down, then we're going to have a problem with the stock. For now, it remains a very good stock that everybody should consider in their portfolios. Next, we have Tesla. I told you that my number, what I'm looking for is a quarter over quarter growth of a minimum of 45% to justify the out of whack valuation. This is exactly what Tesla delivered last year. Did they deliver a minimum of 45% growth quarter over quarter in revenues? Of course not. The growth rate was a mere 15%. Is this good or bad? Of course it's good. You're not going to see such growth rate in any automotive manufacturer. Toyota, Ford, GM, none of the traditional car makers have this growth rate quarter over quarter. Tesla remains a growth company. The problem is the valuation is out of whack. This is a company that is trading at almost $1 trillion valuation. You got to at least deliver 50% growth rate quarter over quarter to justify the valuation. I don't know what's going on with the call right now, but to maintain this valuation, Elon Musk needs to trim the fat here. They need to cancel the Model S and Model X altogether. They're garbage. Nobody wants them anymore. You have the Model 3 and Model Y. These two are ahead. The S and the X, they're garbage. Cancel them all together to make the operation leaner. And more efficient. Likewise, all the dreams about the Cybertruck and the Roadster, these two are not going to keep the valuation intact. They're not good enough. The only product for Tesla that Elon Musk should be concentrating 1 million percent on is the value product. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Tesla meant for the Indian market which is a fully electric car from Tesla with all the bells and whistles. Great technology, no downgrades whatsoever, but with a price tag between fifteen dollars and $20,000. This will be appealing to the Indian market and it could generate millions of dollars being sold by Tesla in the Indian market. And this is exactly what Reverend Elon Musk is eyeing right now. He is requesting a meeting with Indian Prime Minister Modi because he realizes that to keep this cartoonish valuation intact, you need another growth factor in the company. And this is not going to be the Cybertruck. It's not going to be the Roadster. It's going to be the new product meant for the Indian market. Next, we have Lamb Research. What's happening here? Why is the stock trading down after hours? The answer is we talked about the margins, the gross margins and the operating margins. They gave us a prediction that the margins will be intact, the same margins from last quarter. This came out disappointing. The margins went down. This is the gross margin, of course, went down from 46.5% last quarter down to 46%. Likewise, the operating income margin went down from 32.6% to only 32.4%. These might not be big numbers and big differences for you, but the expectations were with the chip shortage, margins should be improving, not going down. And therefore, this is a massive disappointment 
for LAM research. But I do believe that the dips will be bought in this name regardless because we need to produce more chips. We have a massive chip shortage. To produce all of these chips, you're going to need equipment from LAM research. Now let's move on to earnings previews. What do we have tomorrow in the earnings calendar? We have American Airlines. Southwest Airlines, AT&T, Union Pacific, Intel, Chipotle, and Snapchat. We're going to go over some of those, specifically American Airlines, Union Pacific, Intel, Chipotle, and Snapchat. We start with American Airlines. Again, just like with our discussion with United Airlines, I'm looking at the revenue growth head-to-head -head with the aircraft fuel and labor expenses. Are revenues growing at a faster pace than expenses? If that is the case, now, for now, the name remains intact. The problem arises if expenses continue to rise higher at a faster pace than the increase of revenues. For example, last quarter, the year-over-year -year growth in revenues was 590%. On the other hand, the growth in aircraft fuel was up 521% year-over-year. And for salaries and wages for labor, the growth was about 10% year-over-year. So we continue to watch these margins as fuel costs and energy costs in general continue to surge higher. How will airlines keep with expenses going higher and higher and higher? It's pretty much impossible. You have pricing power right now due to the holiday season. But what happens after that if energy prices continue to rise higher and higher and higher? Not a good industry to be in. I'm avoiding airlines like the plague. Next, let's talk about Union Pacific. This is an important company. It's an inflationary name, a classic bet that inflation will continue to rise higher, and the name has been delivering and outperforming the rest of the market. Yet the importance of the earnings from Union Pacific is not limited to the company itself. It also gives us outlook and more information regarding the future prospects of inflation. What am I talking about here? This is a company with huge, huge pricing power. You want goods to be transported, pay us more. And they're going to flex their pricing power. And if they do, then prices will spiral out of control for consumers. And therefore, I'm looking for particular categories in this earnings report. Last quarter, the growth rate for freight revenues was up 29% year over year. You got to pin that with the growth in expenses. We're talking about labor costs from compensation and benefits. This was up 13% year over year. And then we have fuel. Fuel costs are up 200% year over year. Unlike airlines, Union Pacific has the pricing power to minimize the increase in fuel costs. And therefore, the net income was up 59% year over year. I'm looking for these margins. What is the growth rate for fuel expenses versus the growth rate in revenues and net income? I'm also looking for specific categories in the report. The fried revenues for grain products, fertilizers, food and frozen items, and coal and renewable energy products. The assumption is they will raise prices higher and the revenue margins will grow. This will be reflected by higher prices for us consumers for these products. Likewise, I'm looking at automotive because the revenue growth rate is pretty much triple what it was a year ago. And they continue to have pricing power here. You have a shortage of cars. You want us to transport these cars that consumers need desperately you got to pay us more. And in turn, of course, the consumer will pay more for the vehicle. This is how inflation works. And therefore, I continue to say that the earnings report from Union Pacific is not just important for the company itself. It is also important for the outlook of inflation. Then we have Intel. The expectations are already low for this company. There is nothing impressive here. The growth is pretty much stagnating for this company, if not being reduced. They're losing business to AMD, they're losing business to NVIDIA, they're getting their asses handed back to them by Apple and other companies who are manufacturing their own chips in-house. The chief of Intel is desperately pleading with Apple to look at their new platforms and new products and hopefully Apple will adapt Intel chips again. I say this is garbage, Apple already moved on and Intel is left behind holding the bag with their pants down. The good news for this company is, in their outlook last time around, they pretty much lowered expectations. That the revenues will not grow at all. Gross margin will be lower than last quarter. The earnings per share will be down from last quarter. So any upside surprise here will pop the stock price higher. It's all about the management of expectations. Intel last time around downplayed the expectations, and this is a wise decision because the element of surprise 
is to the upside. On the other hand, we have a different story here in Snapchat's earnings. The surprise element will be to the downside. What am I looking for in Snapchat's earnings? Here is the slide from last quarter, the average daily active users. The majority of growth, 55% in the rest of the world category, not in Europe, not in North America be it these two categories are also growing yet at a slower pace the problem is that the majority of revenue growth the average revenue per user is coming from the north american and european markets so without growth without growing the number of users they're going to have to squeeze the existing users for more revenue can they do that and what about monetizing the growth in the rest of the world segment can they do that Will they be able to do that? Because as we've seen from Netflix's earnings, for example, yes, we have growth in the Asia Pacific region. Yes, we have growth in the Europe, Middle East and Africa regions. But the revenue per user from the Middle East and Asia Pacific regions is lower, way lower than the North America region. And therefore, the market was not impressed with Netflix's earnings. So if Snapchat delivers good user growth, but the majority of the user growth comes out from the rest of the world segment, then the market will not be impressed. Because when we look at the sheet, for example, the income sheet, last quarter, the revenue pretty much more than doubled year over year. And their net loss was cut by half, more than half. Can they continue to deliver these numbers without growth in users in the North America and Europe segment? We will see. But these are numbers that are very hard to keep up. You cannot grow another 100% year over year in the next quarter. Likewise, they're not going to be able to cut the losses by the same magnitude that they did last quarter, by more than 50%. These are unrealistic expectations, and therefore, the risk for this name is to the downside. The only scenario where this name is going to pop higher, way out of whack, is if we have a profitable quarter for Snapchat. It will be the first profitable quarter for the company. It's a long shot, but who's to say it's not going to happen? Lastly, what about Chipotle's earnings? Again, this is the earnings from last quarter. We're looking at the margins, the revenue growth rate versus the growth rate in expenses. Last time around, the revenue growth for food and beverages was up 38% year over year. On the other hand, the growth in labor cost was up about 17.5% year over year. And all in all, the growth in operating expenses was about 20.5% year over year. Last quarter, the growth of revenues outpaced the growth of expenses, and therefore the stock outperformed. Can they continue to keep this gap between the rate of growth in revenues and expenses? We know that they're hiking wages higher, so labor costs will continue to rise higher and higher and higher. The expenses, the material shortages, the supplies, all of these costs continue to rise higher. Can they match the rate of growth in expenses by increasing their revenues? This will come if they jack prices higher. Do they have the pricing power? Can Chipotle raise prices without deterring consumers away? We will see. And lastly, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims. On top of that, we have the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index. We have existing home sales and leading economic indicators. We also have Governor Waller speaking about the economy. Governor Waller, a few days ago on Monday, said that interest rates could be hiked earlier than expectations because inflation is surging out of whack. Will he retract the statement or will he double down? This is what I'm watching for in the economic calendar tomorrow. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now for this video. But I will talk to you again soon. <laughs> If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.